Now this morning, it's still Saturday as I film this, I had every intent on doing the very first serious live stream here in the shop. We were actually going to do some forging projects. We had three different camera angles. Janet was here to do some switching to change which camera you were looking at for the best view of the project at that moment. Everything was set up. Everything was working just right until just before time to start and then our internet went down. I'm John Switzer and you're watching Black Bear Forge. So the live stream was a complete failure and for those of you who stopped by to watch the live stream, I appreciate you stopping by and I'm sorry that it didn't work out. But so that we can still present that information, we're going to go ahead and take a look at what I was going to do for the live stream and that was some fold forming. Now fold forming isn't something I've done a whole lot of. This is really a chance for me to experiment with the technique. And I chose this for the live stream because it was the subject for the Rocky Mountain Smiths demo last month. And since that didn't happen, I thought I would go ahead and try to present some of that information. I think Emiro, who is going to do that demo, probably has a much better grasp of fold forming than I do. And I would really like to see his demo in the future when things get back to normal. But as long as we're not having live events, I'm going to try and present similar topics here if it's something I think I can do justice during a live stream. But since the live stream didn't work out, we're going to do it as a regular video. I already have a fire going in the forge, so let's get to work. About the simplest thing you can do with a fold form then, just to fold the material over. I'm not worrying too much about the edges. I kind of like the more free organic look that you get from not worrying about straight and square sometimes. And then you open it back up again, at least in most cases. I've seen a lot of different varieties of fold forming and this is just the basics of it. I'm just using that. I'm not going to try and cut it. I just want to open it up so I can get to it here. And I'm going to go to a rawhide mallet so I don't mess up that nice crisp edge I've got. And this is real thin. This is about 16 gauge sheet metal. So that's a a good start there. I would like to clean that up and that's just depends on what you're doing with it. I'm just going to put that on the edge of the anvil so I don't mess up that crease. And that is the most basic of folds. Now it's just a matter of what do you do with that? What purpose does that serve? Well, we've taken a look at a leaf once, and the vein in the leaf was created by fold forming. So it's a valid technique for it right there, is just create a vein in a leaf. So let's do another piece, and I'm going to start it pretty much the same way, and we're just going to kind of build on this idea in separate pieces each time. Again, this thin stuff doesn't need to be very hot. I think this is a popular technique for copper smiths. You see a lot of stuff looking for this online that applies to copper. And you can probably get some good ideas for patterns and ways to go with this. So that's just the same starting point we were at before. We're just going to make another fold a little bit of distance away from that. Let's see if we can just open that up with a pair of tongs. Again, the Rawhide mallet keeps you from messing up the, the fold so much. Let's 
So now we have a double. Let's do one more. Let's go ahead and turn this one into a triple. You say I'm just messing around, seeing what happens. I don't have a preconceived plan here. These things can be kind of hard to keep from unbending at your original fold that's been thinned a little bit by hammering it so it can affect that some. Just kind of be aware of where it wants to bend and control it if you want to control it or let it do what it wants to do if you just want to see what the material is trying to do. Now what purpose does this serve? Again, that's just kind of up to what you see in your mind with this stuff. I'll talk a little bit at the end of the video about what I might do with some of these. So that's just another set of folds. Very interesting effect. Let's do uh, something a little heavier and let's make them cross. This is a piece of eighth inch sheet metal, so about 11 gauge, 12 gauge, something like that. And I'll do one across and one lengthwise. I'll fold towards one end here. And the eighth inch is a little bit harder to fold and crease. Because you don't necessarily have to put a sharp crease. You could draw that to a point, or you can leave it kind of blunt and rounded. Let's see if we can get this to open up some. Now the uh, eighth inch material does stay hot faster than that 16 gauge or 18 gauge, whatever those other ones were. Just Playing with some scrap is a good way to learn this. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put another one across the other direction. So for this, I'm just going to go to the vise and I'm going to hold that so that that first fold isn't in the vise. Get that started. Try to line it up across here. I'm running out of heat, so take another heat if you need it. But I think we're okay. And that starts my fold pretty much where I want it. Like I say, I don't mind these things being a little organic and a little misaligned sometimes. And again, holding that off the edge there, wherever. It seems like the best place to work. You get to be kind of hard to hold on to as you go from single layer to double layer, you start pinching your tongs in there. But one way or the other, I'm going to try and fold this up as tight as I folded the first one. And I'll just clamp just a little bit in the vise and see if I can start opening it up with the hot cut. So that starts to open that in. Let's do the other end. And of course, I'm still trying to avoid crushing my original fold, so it's always out of the vise. This is where multiple folds really start to get weird. If you start trying to do three or four or something. And I've seen people do that. I'm just not real sure how they manage to pull it off without 
screwing everything up. Again, the rawhide mallet helps keep you from messing things up. They also stink when you use them to hold stuff. And here's a place that having a step with a square corner or working over the tail of the anvil like I was doing earlier really comes in handy. And that helps you get that nice and flat again. <clears throat> if you want it flat, maybe you don't. I think proportionately that would have looked better moved down a little bit. So when you do the next one, you can move it down a little bit. Now this would look good bronzed brushed, I think. I'm going to use power. Because you get way more bronze faster, or brass. I guess I don't know which this brush is. I've used both. But at speed, it comes off maybe nicer. Now that little wire wheel is rated at 20,000 RPMs and should work on my die grinder but it does not behave very well on the die grinder. It's really kind of jumpy, so I don't use it on there. And the drill is plenty fast enough to get a really nice effect. Well, let's do one more piece. This is a big piece of 3 16 thick, and that's gonna be about my limit. I have done quarter inch thick, just testing the theory out, and it's a huge amount of work, and I don't think I'd do much with that, but depending on how hard you want to work. So I think this one, what I'm going to do is just kind of do some three lines, but one at each end, not necessarily parallel, and one across here, and just kind of a free form sort of a thing. Then maybe we'll turn this into a dish. And this one, I think I'm going to do the long bend first. I think this, this might make it easier to work with. Back in the fire. We could make tacos. I think this 3 16 material is more than twice as hard to work as the 8 inch material was. But that's okay. Also, I am not going to go to the quarter-inch material today. That's just too much. If we get this to line up over this monster of a hot cut, we should be able to spread it open.
That's getting there. Pretty soon we'll be able to just put it over the edge of the anvil. We're about to that point. I have to buy new rawhide heads for this thing after this project. Heck, maybe you just like that twisted up thing and you just leave it like that. I've got to worry about getting this too perfectly flat because we're just going to put another bend in it right about there. Okay, I'm going to a four pound rawhide mallet here. Now, as you do this, be careful you don't flatten this out on the face of the anvil. The mallet's going to take care of one side, but the anvil is still hard and will still mess this up if you let it. Okay, bend this side open. Start working on that. Now we should be able to go back to the anvil. Now, if anybody was hoping for origami swans out of forged iron, I'm not the guy. I'm just going to clean that up just a little more. You can probably get in here with a set hammer. I don't know if that's important or not. So this then is about the same stage as that last one. It's just a, a nice cross and people like crosses so that may be all you want to do. And I want to go a little further. I'm going to make sure this other one is definitely not square because I'm trying not to make it look geometric. And this is a little more geometric than I wanted. So let's make that definitely off center. Go back to the vise and open it up. Mm -hmm. Get that pair of tongs on there or not? Kinda. I think we can get that over the anvil.
probably can't see me when I step all the way out like that. But. So where uh, set hammers start making more sense. But what do we do with this? This is just a an artistic thing at the moment. I was wondering what it might be like to go ahead and dish that a little bit and see if we can make a little bit of a tray for your spare change or your car keys, something like that. So let's see if we can roll this up a little bit without destroying the element we've created. This is a lot more fun in the winter. It's kind of hot right now. It's not dishing very evenly, which I guess doesn't surprise me. We've got these built-in stiffening ribs now that prevent it from dishing. But it is dishing somewhat. It's the closest I'm going to come to a campfire this year. Still too hot and dry to have an actual fire. This has a hollow in it, so that's what I'm dishing into. And because it's wood, it does not mark up the material like an iron block would. But since people ask what this monster chain link is for, it can be really handy for this kind of thing. I need to do some straightening. But this does create enough of a hollow that we can work with it. I just want to bring these ends down and hopefully create something that will sit fairly flat. That seems like it might. going to take some of the really bad wrinkles out of the edge here. But because of the rib, that actually sits pretty darn flat. Don't know if this is a good idea or bad idea. I think an eighth inch it would have been a little easier to shape. But I think you get the idea. And yes, it'd be nice to have a touch mark on here, but I should have done that earlier. So I think I will omit it at this point. Since in reality, these are all just practice. Well, that is just a very rudimentary look at doing some fold forming. There are lots of places you can take this technique. I've seen some really elaborate work done with this. Can't really remember how it's done, so I'm just starting at the very basics. And one of these days, maybe I'll explore it more or hopefully find some articles in some magazines or look at some old blacksmithing conference videos, something like that, and maybe figure out what the next step in this process would be. But just take some scrap sheet metal and try it out. I recommend the eighth inch. I think it behaves very well. It's easy enough to forge that it's not the struggle that this 3 16 was. The quarter inch was a whole lot of work. I really don't recommend it. And the 16 gauge, 18 gauge kind of stuff, I think it's just a little bit too flimsy, but it is easy to work with and you do a lot of it cold, just keep annealing it so it doesn't crack. And of course, this piece we made a dish out of, suitable for your car keys, your loose change, something like that. So it may have some sort of practical use. 
This other piece we made a nice little cross out of that would make an interesting little wall hanging just like it is. That could be inset into a cabinet door or front door or something like that or simply have a little loop put on it so that you can hang it on the wall. Lots of possibilities for what you might do with an interesting little element like that. These other pieces I did as test pieces getting ready for this video. I just wanted to test it out and see what material thicknesses kind of did what. And again, these would be nice just decorative elements that were inset into a piece of woodwork, perhaps incorporated into some other ironwork. They can simply be wall hanging art or they can sit up on a shelf somewhere. Lots of possibilities. People might really like these at craft shows. It's kind of hard to say. You can put little hangers on them. But I also envision these with maybe a chest handle attached to it somehow. How you do that without messing up the fold form, you'd have to kind of make sure everything was in the right place so you can put some standoffs or some staples or whatever you need to, to make the chest handle work. But I think there's some potential there or maybe even the back plate for a door knocker or something like that. So lots of possibilities for things like this. Like so many things in blacksmithing, it's just a starting point. It's up to you and up to your imagination and your creativity where you take it and what you do with it. Now, I believe Roy over at Christ Centered Ironworks has done some fold forming. It seems like I saw some videos of his quite a while back. So if I can find those again, I will link to those right up here and you should be able to then maybe see the next step in the evolution or perhaps some more refined work. I think Roy's probably done more of this than I have. In fact, what you saw today more than doubled my experience with fold forming. Now, as far as the live streams go, yes, I'm going to keep working on that. I believe the live streams still have a very valid purpose. They aren't the same as the regular videos or an edited video. Live streams are about community. They're about live interaction. And it's a different vibe, a different feel. And the two things aren't necessarily for the same crowd. There are some people that love live streams, some people that love the edited videos. Some like both of them, but if you like one, watch the one you like. And if you don't like the other, don't watch that one. It doesn't hurt my feelings if you don't like live streams and don't watch the live streams. But I really do feel like these days when we aren't able to gather with our regular club and local meetings, most of the big conferences have been canceled this year, that having that sense of community that can happen during a live stream is an important thing for the blacksmithing community. So I'm going to keep plugging away. I don't give up that easily. And I think we can make this all work out. But if not, I know Yamez and Roy and some other people are still doing live streams. So there are some live streams out there to watch. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. I do hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button down there. Feel free to stick around, watch a few of the other videos, share the videos with your friends. If you would like to provide financial support for the videos here at Black Bear Forge, there are links in the video description for both PayPal and Patreon. Those are merely donations. The content is free. In the meantime, I hope you have time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, stay safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next one.